What's up, fam? Hope your carrots are going well from the first episode. <laughs> Thanks for joining us again for our second episode of Asking for a Mate, where the proven share their process. Our special guests today are from the world of Pacific and Aotearoa filmmaking. Ooh wee! Simao Wale is an award-winning director whose internationally recognized career features many classic work such as Automati and Coffee and Allah. Velma Fileo also has an extensive career and a recently released first featured film for My Father's Kingdom is already gaining international critical acclaim. So pull up a seat, join us and Paul Lisi at the pellet table as they share their stories that will hopefully inspire you on your own journey. Manuna. The rest of our stories, because we're not just funny, yeah. we're also really flawed, we're, um, you know, we're angry, we're, we're sad. We are all the, the range of emotions. Well, this is just why uh, more of us need to make write stories, mm. make stories, um, just to give us more dim dimension. So, so you see, for example, Once Were Warriors, okay? That came out and the poor Māoris <laughs> yeah. were kind of stuck with that uh, domestic violence. You know, I mean, they were stuck with that for years. Yeah. Amazing film, undoubtedly powerful, moving. But they were stuck with that for several years mm. until another Māori film could come out and, you know, Change show it. a different perspective. Um, so same with us. You kind of feel kind of responsible, but at the same time, you know, you've got to tell your own genuine story, eh? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, how did you feel? Yeah. yeah. How did yeah. you find that process of crafting the story but knowing that the story was so personal to you? Um, I think, oh, well, it, it is a very emotional film and, and it's an emotional process because, you know, it's like, it's all the shit from my childhood, reliving it every freaking day yeah. for in the edit and then having to kind of bring it up and put my family through torture, you know? Mm. It's, so, <clears throat> yes. It is an emotional film, and I'm just going to try and not cry and ruin my makeup. Um, but yeah, so I, but I had to do the process, and I had to dig really deep because I knew I know that I am a hafikasi, and I know that straight away I have um, things put on me. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Perceptions, yeah. people's own perceptions put on me. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to make something where it is potentially going to help change, make change, mm -hmm. then it has to come from the absolute place of authenticity mm -hmm. and um, come from a place where no one can challenge you about that's not your story because actually that's my damn life. Yeah, <laughs> you literally. Know? Yeah, literally. Yeah. So, and... And you know, when, when you talk to people and you say, you're doing things the wrong way, what happens? They shut down, they don't listen, they don't want to have a bar of it. So I knew that I didn't want to do anything that would um, turn the church off mm -hmm. and get the Tongan community saying, hey, don't watch this, this is, this is bad for us, it's giving us a bad name. And so you have to come from a place of love yeah. because who is going to, no one can challenge it if you come from a place of love and yeah. or authenticity, you know? You laid a lot of it bare, but in a in an honest way mm. and not a judgmental way. Yeah. I just loved it, you know what I mean? Some of, you know, it's just, um, this is just the way we are. You know, you didn't bother prettying it up in, at places like, there was a rawness to it, which was beautiful. Mm. I love the basketball ring, you know, covering, oh. you see that? She covers the window and then the basketball, Oh, I love it. Island humour. It's gorgeous. <laughs> mm. Yeah. 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 Well, mm. yeah, I mean, I, I guess that that is the thing is life is raw, you know. Yeah. Mm. Movies tell us one thing, but the actuality of life, yep. it's not pretty all the time. <laughs> so what, what inspired you to go tell that story? Like, especially on your dad and the family. Um, yeah. Well, because me and my siblings, we were we were hella frustrated with dad. Because it was ridiculous. He would ring us up like on Thursday <laughs> before Missinali on Friday and be like, oh, hi, so it's Missinali tomorrow. Can I have um, a few hundred dollars? And then us kids would be like texting each other going, hey, dad's on the ringing mission. <laughs> He's going to ring up and ask for money. But there was no like warning or anything. And the thing is, it's kind of like this consistent 
kind of ask for money and it's, we're not talking about little amounts here he's just like oh yeah if, uh, I got a dad like, oh how much and he's like oh 1000 or you know it's like dad no we don't have that we've got bills to pay and so it kind of started from that and even though he would fundraise as well yeah. the the kids of parents still get asked yeah. and get asked yes. to take out loans and th and that's um really common yeah that's that's the beauty of your film was actually seeing really what every island family goes through on Literally. the big screen yeah. uh, the obligations this yeah. is why we do not own our, our own houses, houses. Exactly. Yes. and why we do not drive BMW because yes. if we didn't have our lovey lovers we would be driving BMWs thank you very much hey? exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. and have a savings yeah. <laughs> a savings but, account what's that yeah, yeah exactly but wow. it's a foreign concept still right you know so foreign um, yeah. and, and so that's where it started from yeah. it started from there but you can't go out and wag your finger at people yes. and say you're doing it the wrong way blah 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 right because no one's going to yeah. listen. Everyone's going to shut down. It didn't feel like you were lecturing at all. Not at all. Um, it was just really nice to see our values up there. Yeah. And how did you combat that? Like, what what were you putting in place for yourself? Because, you know, no doubt there would have been times you'd be like, don't say that. Or don't, don't do that. Or, you know, like, how did you um, kind of find that balance? Well, we, as a family... Um, decided that we were going to go all in mm. and be all honest and it was all in or nothing because if we're going to do this we're not going to muck around you know yeah. it's like all on go big or go home you know so <laughs> we're already putting our shit out there on the big screen so we might as well just um, go the full Monty and so there was there was pretty much nothing really that we didn't want to talk too much about mm. yeah and and we all kind of <laughs> would talk about it together yeah. and be like oh yeah mum said this dad said this Robert said yeah. this and so like the whole time kind of filming it was kind of like this conversation that we would well mainly I would be having to everyone else yeah. but so everyone kind of knew where we were all at I think so, too and yeah. along with the process because it's kind of it's still really, even though we talked about stuff in the film, it's still hard to talk about stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, awesome. So there was kind of like no out of bounds. Mm. <laughs> in trying and convincing your dad as well, to be honest, like how, how did that go? <laughs> well, you know, um, with dad, he was, he was um, like, oh yeah, I'm, I really want to do this. I, I want you guys to understand me. Um, so there was no problem with getting dad to, you know, agree to just be to himself. Do it. Yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. Awesome. and you know, <laughs> it's like so. Yeah, that no, was all good. And there were so many parts where it was like, oh, that's so my dad, or the humour would come through. But also, I think one of the really strong things about um, how your dad was seen was the emotion, because I don't know for you guys, but for me, it's like men especially Pacific men, don't show that much emotion. And then we look at our fathers. Our fathers are the disciplinarians. They, they are the, the breadwinners. They're not the ones who will coddle you or, you know, cry with you. Mm -hmm. So it was, really, um, it was really beautiful to see that. And then to have your brother also be on that same vein was really powerful, I think. And their conversation where everything was said but almost nothing was said, <laughs> is quintessential yeah. Pacifica father-son mm -hmm. relationships. Like that was, yeah, it was really, um, punched me in the gut because I was like, oh yeah, I, I know that conversation. <laughs> I've had that conversation where I want to say something, but nothing comes out. Yeah. And you feel like you're butting your head up against a wall, especially with your dad. Who's like this big presence in your life, and it's just like, Meh. so yeah, it was it was really strong, and it was great having you guys there as sisters. Couldn't just be like, okay, fine, let's all just pitch in, don't sleep, and cook the damn let's thing. Let's do the pigs. Yeah. <laughs> oh that was God. epic. The that pigs. Was like, oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. 
But it's true though, you know, us island women do just like, oh, just get on with it and yeah. do it. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. But but that's a woman thing. Mm. You know, you know what one of the underlying currents of this film is, is that, that males can go off and do whatever they want, whenever they want. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And who's left at home to pick up the pieces, look after yeah. the kids, cook the pigs? <laughs> no, no, but you know? And, and it's a real, like... Men, men can get away with a lot of shit, man. Well, you I'm going to fess up, okay? Because yeah. watching your film, I realise what my family don't do. Because we don't follow the norm. So my family are a bit abnormal. It's like, so <laughs> we're watching your film and going, and we recognise it, we know it, our cousins go through it, our relatives go through it, but I know mum and dad have done it quite differently with us. We're just, I don't know why, but we have been treated differently. We don't do the fat love. I mean, to see you guys go through that, I'm like, gosh, the relatives could go through all that. So we saw that, but we haven't been put through that as much. Also, our dad, like you said, the you know, uh, you know that patriarchal kind of father, Samoan father. Well, that kind of father is not the kind of father we 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 had a very maternal father that we cuddled and hugged. So it was. Quite often, so he was like our mum. He'd do our washing. <laughs> so you know, so it was a wow. total role reversal. Oh. So he did our washing, uh, cooked for us, and mum was the breadwinner. So we were all role reversal, uh, which is probably why we're like a little bit odd, our family, and why people look at us differently. Well, well, look at how open-minded your family is. Your siblings are. Look at where they are in today's world, you know? Yeah. And it's probably a product of like, well, you know, yeah, having so that true. kind of... Yeah, and not uh, going with the expectations. Because we all know, I think as islanders, what it's like to have expectations, obligations, because that's what your film is about mm. too, and have that on you. And the pressure's enormous. And we've seen that pressure on, on um, our family members, mm. you know? So yeah, it was beautiful to see that and feel it. Yeah. But also for me to go, oh, thank God I didn't go through that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to be honest, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just, uh, and I guess that's the freedom that mum and dad allowed us to have. Just a bit different, yeah. Yeah, speaking of those pressures, like, I know for a lot of Pacific families, going into the arts is not really an option. So how did... You, I'm, I mean, you know, your mum being the formidable woman that she is, legend, legend <laughs> at how old is she now? 80. 80, still painting. Yeah. You know, so with you, I can completely understand that your mum would have been like, yeah, okay, go, do what you want. But, you know, with... And that's exactly what she did yeah. when I was 17. I was just like, okay, go. Oh, mum, I want to leave school. Okay, go. Mum, I really hate my name, Karen. Can I change it? Oh, okay, darling. <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh, okay. And then my grandmother, Sima, comes over and I'm like, oh, grandma, I'll take your name, thank yeah. you. Oh. Um, and it's like, you know, at 18, oh, mum, I really like, you know, I want to do something else, you know. Okay, darling, <laughs> go on the door, go do some art course. In that minute, I'm doing drama. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's just awesome. really lucky. Yeah. Oh. I'm very lucky. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But with... Like your family, for example, like how did wanting to pursue a career in the arts, um, I guess, juxtapose with your dad's ideas of what you what he wanted you guys to do or what he wanted the family to do? Well, with with da with mum and dad, the key, the key has always been like education. Mm -hmm. So they just wanted us to achieve well in in our education. And so if we, you know, that meant like we just had to get like fifty, like pass, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all Season through high degrees. school, so yeah, just it's just a pass. <laughs> um, but but you know, mum has been really supportive with us in the arts. And dad, he's he's actually probably not kind of the typical Tongan father in a sense that he's just like oh whatever makes you happy mm. I just want you to be happy yeah. you know he's always had that real um kind of uh yeah so it's way about him and yeah so so I've been like you yeah. lucky to not have the pressure to be like mm. I want you to be this 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 mm. this yeah because mum is just she just wants us to pass too you know <laughs> yeah yeah but 
Mm-hmm. Fascinating, because yeah. my upbringing was the complete opposite. Oh, really? Yes, what yeah. happened? How it was about yours? I remember when I was, I think I was in the beginning of high school, and I told my mum, oh, I'm, I'm really interested in becoming a chef. She said, no. I asked my auntie, and she was like, mm, maybe not. My cousin was a chef at the time. Yeah. So then that was kind of fixed, like put to the side, and be like, oh, okay, cool, I don't want to be a chef. Who knows where I could be right now. Um, but, yeah, I'd always um, enjoyed singing and enjoyed performing. And so um, growing up, my dad was a muso. Um, and, you know, Matt knows their history goes way back. Um, but he never really was one to be like, oh, yeah, you're wanting to pursue acting. Great. He's, he'd always be like, oh, what are, you, what are you wanting to do now? Why do you want to do this? My mum was also uh, very much the same. She was like, you know, you should go. Fail out on that. Do do school. Make sure you pass. Um, Be a doctor or lawyer. Um, I think it was a lawyer at one okay. point. Mm. Um, you know, my sister wanted to become an architect. She didn't. Um, <laughs> She wanted me to, me to be a lawyer or something. I didn't. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a really interesting um, dynamic trying to grow up where you feel this real pull to the arts, but there wasn't that support. Um, so I, I guess the way that I did find it was within the communities that I was able to kind of, after university, immerse myself into, which is like, working with you on Fresh and, you know, um, finally meeting you and, and being like, oh my God, um, and your siblings and, and the kind of path that they had um, created, I guess, for a lot of Pacifica creatives who are still in the game now. Um, so I just want to thank you for that. Oh, we didn't but, even um, mean to do any of that. <laughs> the, the, and that's the, the best kind of intention or the best kind of path is where it's, not intended to be this amazing thing, but it just happens to be. Um, and so kind of riffing off that, I guess, going back into that, the whole discussion that we were talking about before around about um, it being our time now, um, I wanted to touch a bit on um, what you guys thought about how do Pacific people claim spaces that are traditionally not Theirs for someone, someone young and up and coming who is wanting to get into that. How? What would you? What were some of the things that you guys did to to make sure that you guys claimed those spaces? Well, I mean, I guess too. I mean, when I went to film school in Australia, I was the only brown person in the whole film school. You know, literally, they didn't know where I came from. They just didn't know Samoa. Where's that? Mm-hmm. Um, so Samoa. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, so, but uh, I like being different. I don't, I I actually found it, being different, the odd one out, is actually a, a benefit. Mm. <laughs> you stick out, it's great. <laughs> so I think for our people, if you find yourself in one of those situations where you, you're a, a, a minority, see it as a very unique place it's a very special place to be and not something where you feel um you know um you don't have a voice i think it's the total opposite you have a more of a voice because more people are looking at you like you know Mm. um and kind of have pay attention to you because you are different i mean who wants to be like everyone else (laughs) give us stuff so um I actually uh, milk it for all it's worth. Mm -hmm. And on sets, I'm often, especially way back in the day, I'm often the only brown person. I mean, because I'm like the the director on, on, say, commercial shoots. You know, like maybe initially they mistook me for unit or, you know, go make the coffees. (laughs) Oh, I love that trick. I love that, you know. It's wonderful, because I do like making people coffee, but, you know, <laughs> but I think it's great. I love playing that trick on people. It's like, fuck, yeah. And then, you know, later, you know, um, yeah, I just do my thing. So I don't actually, I don't actually get intimidated at all by being surrounded by <laughs> foreigners. I, I really get on with Germans really well for some odd reason when I meet them. <laughs> 
like Germans. Mm. It's just weird, but yeah. Um, so no, I, I loved that space. Mm. I, I just loved that space. I, I really don't mind it at all. How about you? Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I mean, I, well, growing up, we, we were always kind of on the edge anyway, because, yeah. you know, in Hamilton, we were the only, um, Pacific, well, pretty much the only Pacific Island family at school anyway. So I've always kind of been on the, on the edges. When I moved up to Auckland, I, we had a complete culture shock. Like, there's so many brown people. <laughs> and they're not Maldives. <laughs> so it was kind of, it was a, it was a bit of, um, you know, but, but I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I just really just roll, roll with it as well. You know, um, I guess um, what I try to do though, uh, with especially Tongans, um, well, mainly only Tongans, <laughs> no, um, uh, but is to try and encourage filmmaking. So when we go back to Tonga, we always try and like pull in our local um, people who are interested and chuck them on the camera or chuck them on the sound. So I always try and, I don't know, increase kind of a interest in, in arts and stuff in Tonga. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's just kind of, um, majority though, I've kind of worked on PI shows in the industry, yeah. like yeah. With, with Fresh and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So yeah. So it's been quite nice. It has, <laughs> and you know, lots of fun. And I and guess too, as a woman, you know, I find myself like being, you know, a woman because it was a really male dominated industry. Um, even today, if you're doing drama and stuff like that, there's a lot of males everywhere. It's getting a bit better. But um, someone once said to me, uh, Sima, you know, how do you find the sexism in the industry, you know, and all these men and stuff? And I said, hey, I got no problem bossing men around. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, not, no problem. I've got no problem. Uh, you know, it's um, so I actually just relish the role. I mean, I relish it. It, it is interesting it's going fun. onto like a proper Palangi yes. set yeah. off the back of a island set, though. It's a different, you know, oh, there's no mucking around, no loud laughing on, on this set. No. <laughs> you know, it's all straight business. So that that's a different. Um, there's just a different work dynamic to yeah. it. Yeah. No running off to eat halfway through yeah. a shot. No. Yeah. Or no bungy popos or mm. anything and catering. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I went to Fiji once to uh, help a maid out because he wanted me to go over there, save some commercials or something because something went wrong. So I fly over and, <laughs> and it's got this Fijian crew. So of course it's like, oh. You know, luckily I grew up in Samoa, so I know what islanders are like. I'm like, oi! <laughs> They're like suddenly oop, on their toes. And um, they ended up doing a beautiful job. I love our people, you know. Um, it's just a different attitude of thing. But man, once it's like, like, it's all go. It's really amazing. So yeah, and in Samoa too, uh, for about eight years, I was going back and forth to Samoa. Sometimes I'll just take a break with mum and dad when they were living there. And um, there was another mate over there. He wanted to start up a company and never shot any films before. So mm. so that minute, I'm also over there, supposed to be holidaying, but I'm actually helping to train Samoans. It was the most fun thing. You know, village people, it was just <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure they had a terrible experience, but it was just <laughs> like, you know, just to for them to understand the level they need to get to. And, you know, um, years on, they're like, man, such pros. But it's really proud to be able to um, upskill our people and start, you know, doing their own stuff. It's amazing. I think that's probably been the most satisfying for me. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I just ask for both of you, like, of all the creative disciplines out there, how did you guys fall into this discipline of being on screen, filmmaking, everything around the screen, what was it that got you, what, how did you get into this rabbit hole? Um, well, I went to art school and I wanted to be a painter. I still want to be a painter one day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was studying at art school and then, you know, Adriana? Adriana Tuska, the one who AD, uh, art directed um, Apron strings. Oh yes, yes, yes. yes. So oh. she came over to my house. 
Yeah, and then she walked in and because mine and Emily's house was like kind of poly kitsch artwork everywhere and just kind of like a lot of 70s and ticky stuff and all that kind of stuff. And um, and she walked in, she was like, oh, this is exactly how we need the um, Pacific Beat Street set to look. What are you doing on Thursdays? And I was like, I don't know, what are we up to? <laughs> and um, so we also had to get like jobs in the industry when we were yeah. at art school then. And so I just started like one day a week. Oh, yeah, I think it was like one day a week on yeah. Beat Street, Pacific Beat Street. And then it just rolled from there. So art department, then I did a bit of camera for them with good old Stan and Jill. <laughs> That's another another story. <laughs> um, and then from there, um, Lisa just asked me if I wanted to do some yes. directing. And we started it hearing was, your name around, yes. Yeah, yes, but um, all for about Polyfest. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was the baby director's yeah. thing. And then it just kind of rolled from there. I was like, oh yeah, okay, what ifs? I'll do that, yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> and then just kind of fell in. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So I think for me it was, um, uh, what did I, so I, like I, I ended up, I was at Toy Fakari, so I'm actually a graduate of the drama school and uh, so I actually did professional acting for two years. The funniest thing was, um, there's hardly any brownies, there's hardly any brown scripts, honestly. So I end up doing professional theatre, like I'm doing Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> with an all-white cast, basically, <laughs> except Jim Moriarty, he was there in Māori. So, yeah, and then luckily, um, Lena Owen, you know, so she was, um, this is before she did uh, Once Were Warriors. So Lena, who's like a sis, she's like a big sister. So she, you know, just came over from London. I met her and she, like, wanted to direct a piece written by Rivia Brown and Apirana Taylor or something. So net minute would, you know, I'm acting in Māori plays. So it was actually Māori, the Māori lot and the Pākehā lot that were around me all the time and supporting and hiring me because there was no Pacific people around then doing the theatre stuff. So I ended up doing really well acting for two years in professional theatre. But by the end of two years, I'm like, hmm, how am I going to like get our own stories out there and tell my own history and things? So that's when I looked to film schools um, and there was no film school in New Zealand, like proper film schools. I had to look to America, Europe or Australia. So luckily, Australia had two top film schools really close by. So that's when I went to Melbourne and uh, loved it. Three years doing everything. And, you know, because I'm lazy, I don't want to work my way up. <laughs> I just want to come out and go, okay, I'm a director. <laughs> and just basically, just that confidence to step into the directing role, you just got to do it. Mm. And just came back from the film school and apply and make, you know, make your films. That's how it happens. And it's good sometimes for us to be on the other side, though, mm. way of the arts, I think. And, um, I mean, a lot of my mates, you know, you grow up doing drama together or this and that or projects and then some will go into admin but still in the arts, others, I mean, there's just so many avenues. Some go into script writing, others go into writing novels. It's like such a big area. We're so lucky. We've got all these, um, I don't know, skills at our fingertips. And, and how do you guys find managing that balance between making art just because that's the story you want to tell and making art that has to pay the bills and you've got to kind of cater towards the clients and how do you manage that relationship between doing what you want to do and doing what you have to do? Yeah, that's hard. I film Filmmaking is not sustainable. Mm. Um, the struggle is real. Yeah, and then you have to do projects for like Lisa and then she's like, where, where, where? <laughs> no, it's great. It's great because we do have that option of um, being able to, to to pick up freelance work when it's around yep. and when there's funding there. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm just really lucky that I have a mother who um, owns my house. <laughs> so um, yeah, she's just been really financially, we would not be able to be in the position that we're in without mum's financial backup at all. Mm. And 
Um, so we are really lucky, both me and Jerry have yeah. been able to, you know, he's been able to write and stuff because of um, mum's been able to kind of carry support. us over and yeah. support us. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's a straight, we're a strain on our family. Yeah, yeah. We are. I, I definitely have been throughout the years, um, you know, because in film, you don't make any money. Yeah. So that you don't make yeah. any money, really. Yeah. You just so, got to like, you know, not pretend that you're going to be making money <clears throat> unless you go to Hollywood. But some of us aren't for Hollywood. Yep. We're not like, we didn't come into this industry to go do Hollywood or mm. we're like, ah, no, yeah, we're, we're okay. here to tell our own yeah. stories, you know. Yeah. There's just different ways of, and different things you want to tell. So um, the, the, where you make money is actually the commercials industry and TV. Mm. So if you do TV, you're more likely to get money. You know, you get paid properly. But, um, you know, you... Commercials just aren't my thing, really. So, you know, I get fed up with them. So sometimes I just go, you know, it'd be like, Mom, <laughs> all my siblings. So, yeah. Can you guys dig into why you guys do what you do then? Because obviously it's not for the money and any of that mm. stuff. Like, what drives you guys to just tell these stories in the way that you guys do and commit them forever? Like, once it's on a digital file, we will always be able to see these yeah. stories that you guys make. What drives you guys to be so committed to it? Oh, I think, I think right to matey. Yeah, uh, well, that's actually wanting to, you know, um, bring a critique about our people, you know. It's, um, but also sh tell a different story apart from skits and um, I think uh, what was the other comedy that was on, it was a lot of jandle throwing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, you know, colourful. At Samises, that time, yeah. Samises, yeah, yeah, which is yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even I was on one of yeah, the episodes. Yeah, 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 I know. I remember. But, you know, it was just like, oh, gosh, enough of that. So I wanted to do something more art house and uh, something that um, a lot more serious and mm. that I wanted to speak to our people about. And that was basically about the the treatment of our kids, uh, because our kids do grow up rather fast, you know, which is amazing, which I think is a good thing. But, um, you know, you, you often see, you know, little ones, babysitting the other little ones, you know, and it becomes kind of, you know, parents, adults can often take that for granted. And when you see that all the time, you're like, oh, for God's sakes, you know. Um, it's okay in the village when you're in Samoa because it's all open, everyone can see the kids. But, you know, it's just, you know, in this, you know, um, Western, it's just really different. Like it's, um, yeah, so I, would, I wanted to get that message across to our people. So it is actually a critique uh, about how we are with our kids. Um, and I haven't found too many Samoans offended by it. I think, you know, because it, you know, but I, I I always say to them, if if anyone is, at least it's not once we're warriors. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you really want a story. It's like you go there, but you see, the, it, it's exactly to be the opposite to, of once we're warriors. That's what I want. Because once we're warriors came out just before, and I was like, no, I've got to tackle this differently. Just films that, um, can get to people in different ways. So that's why Automate is black and white art house and the way the violence is conveyed is very different. In fact, the parents are actually absolutely normal. They're lovely parents. They're not even abusive. <laughs> it's just, you know, the it's from the perspective of kids. That's what makes it seem so violent. But they, they, they're actually not horrible parents at all. They're absolutely normal. The only issue is that they work too hard. <laughs> They've come to a country where they think it's better than Samoa. They have to work double time and they don't get enough time with their kids and that's where the issue is, yeah. And so that's this, that's kind of similar, same things yeah. that I'm talking about in my film. Mm. And how old is Automoti? 21 years, 22. 22, 22 yeah. Years. And we've still got the same issues, yeah. Yeah. you know. We've yeah. still got the same problems. Mm. So. Telling the same stories. Interesting, eh? Mm. Yeah, why do you think that is? Because <laughs> we're just trying to all make that money and mm. it's just going to different places and yep. and we like you're saying mm. the things that can happen in Samoa the the looking after the kids in the village lifestyle can happen there but you need to change yes. your lifestyles when you come here and it's like in in the Tongan story yep. 
the, the way that they're giving and the way that their, their church living is happening in Tonga, works in Tonga, but they're trying to apply it here in New Zealand and it just doesn't work. Yeah. So you just need to kind of try and change and adapt to your current environment. And that's obviously still not happening, yeah. you know. Yeah, right. There's still a massive communication or what I don't even know what it's called. Mm. Just education of how to live in New Zealand properly and prosper. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Just to segue that whole topic about coming from the islands here and so forth, one of the um, messages in the podcast that we're trying to kind of get out there is this whole thing around our communities and how they view drinking yeah. mm. and so forth. Like, I mean, like, what are your guys' experiences around alcohol in our Pacific communities and, and the drinking culture, <laughs> the drinking culture and the excess and all that sort of stuff that goes around it, and especially around drinking and driving and so forth. Yeah, well, I mean, I think because Europeans they kind of tend to drink to converse, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's really like kind of different attitude in terms of, you know, it's not drink to get drunk. <laughs> I think there's too much drink to get trashed here rather than. Um, yeah, actually see it as a um, social yeah social mm. meeting people. I think the mm. interaction and actually discuss yeah. really cool things to be inspiring to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, I don't drink myself. I'm I've never drunk, um, but I've seen a lot of people. The difference <laughs> between groups of people that drink to get trashed and those that drink to socialise, um, which can be really inspiring, especially for a non-drinker, <laughs> to be in a group that are, you know, are there to converse, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and then when you're around people that drink to get trashed, it's very unpleasant, uh, very unpleasant for um, someone like me, so yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, I was brought up in Hamilton, so <laughs> <laughs> we were the drink to get trashed ones, yeah. you know, mimmy your pants and you had a great night. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was, it was yeah. really, that's the culture there. Um, yeah. So, um, but you know, of course that was a whole kind of side that we kind of kept away from dad, like dad wouldn't yeah. really, um, you know, we were kind of seen as the kind of the naughty ones because we were kind of able to drink and go out and go go out in Tonga. We used to go out in Tonga, which was quite bad. Because, um, you know, you it, it's only just in the last five years or so where Tongan females have started drinking, going out in Tonga. Before that, it was like only very, very rare to see, um, like only the really naughty ones or the older ones oh, or the yeah. ones that were kind of married and, you know, but it was kind of rare to um, see um, young mm. ones out drinking, maybe in the last seven, no, okay, 10 years. Yeah. But that's still quite, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, a lot of Tongans are Wesleyan um, and that's not uh, drinking culture. So the men often drink kava. Mm. Um, and I mean, some of them, um, drink uh, alcohol with it as well as kava but um it's yeah i mean drinking is really looked down upon within the general sort of tongan culture well, most of it yeah so um to change well i mean because we have glasses of wine and i've tried to kind of you know becoming a mother i think normalizing it and not making it such a big like, oh, we're gonna get alcohol tonight or or just like just having it and it's okay to just have a few drinks, mm. you know, is, I don't know, it's still kind of like this weird thing. What about with your upbringing, you know, cause was that like no alcohol? Yeah, it was, it was absolutely no alcohol. Um, my dad was a, he uh, was a big drinker, my mum, was not so living with those two people in the same house was really interesting um and my dad's my dad's family um weren't big drinkers either mm. but when the men would do the umu 
that's when the drinking would, would come out because you had to stay up so late. And so sometimes when the kids were around, it'll be like all the old men in, in the garage, either in the garage or outside in the umu, um, having having their beers. And that was really the only time that we saw drinking growing up. Um, and so going to your point, it wasn't really normal. Um, a normal part of the, our everyday kind of conversation where you sit down, where nowadays you can sit down um, at dinner and have a beer. Yeah, it was really interesting kind of um, trying to navigate the really intense drinking culture um, that a lot of Pacific people have. Mum would be like, hey, you guys uh, drink, drink in front of me, not behind my back. So it's yeah. like, so yeah, so it kind of was just so normal. So that, yeah, it wasn't anything big deal for us. Yeah, it's quite opposite. I know it was really odd <laughs> for an island family. Yeah. What's, what's the mentality when you guys walk onto a film set or when you get a pitch put in front of you? Like with your craft, what is, how do you, what, what, what's the mindset? What, what, are you, what are the pinch points you're looking for to, to get you in, in a direction to head down? Like what, what goes through your... Well, you know? I don't know, but um, like, like there, I, I, I actually always wanted to be a painter too. And I still, it's still paint, like maybe once every three, five years, I'll, I'll pick up a paintbrush. So that's so weird that we're both painters. I don't know, maybe just that visual thing with uh, filming. It's, it's still a visual storytelling, yeah. So uh, maybe it's all from that too, that interest in painting and, and the way things look. It's all about lighting and shadows. That's what I love too. So... Um, I kind of look at filmmaking like painting on a canvas and uh, when I'm filming a scene, I'm painting it like, and the lights are like the paint brushes, you know? So I can put a, a blue light, it's like putting a blue paint across it. <laughs> a red light, it's like, a, it's like paint brushes. So the lights are like my paint brushes, uh, the, the set is like my canvas. Um, uh, the actors are like my portraits. So yeah, that's the way I look at things. So, and I love the play of light and shadow. It's beautiful. I always try and push my uh, cameraman, my DOPs, into just pushing the artistic eye a lot more on the, because I love composition and framing and all that. So it's really beautiful. Um, so, yeah, and so a picture tells a thousand words. So I still really believe in that, even when the image is moving. Um, yeah, and you're painting pictures, because uh, that's part of the story too. It doesn't necessarily require dialogue or, or, or saying it. it. Also, the picture just can say a lot. I think that's that's kind of similar to me, because I um, I think that's why I like documentary over drama, is because I like working with a set of images that have already been, well, you know, I go out and shoot them and I make them the way that I want them to be, but then I can kind of construct it together rather than have the set script and then try and work off the script. You know, I, I kind of like working off the visual first. So, I mean, that's, mm. that's I think, I th yeah, that's yeah. a really good way I mean, of I've, I've done so. documentary, uh, like I've done documentaries for different companies and things like that, and I did one called Velvet Dreams. I've but got I... that sign. Oh. <laughs> I stole it from the Top oh, Shelf really? office. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it really frustrates me, documentary, because obviously I'm more of a control freak, so... Because documentary is, uh, it's beautiful, but I mean, it's a, it takes a lot of discipline. I, so I'm not jealous of documentary makers. Um, we love everything just being pedantic, very detailed, very planned, uh, all the shots all sorted, the set. We know the actor is going to move from A to B, you know, they're not going to go missing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there's a lot more planning involved with drama. Mm. Yeah, see, I like doing the work on the other end. The other end, which and, is and, amazing. And edit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. and playing with what's there. Yeah. Mm. And crafting the story from there. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. The technical aspect, you guys get heavily involved in, like, how, how do you, you guys get into that? I love technical, I love it. With drama, yeah, really technical, and um, 
you know, if you're a director, especially with drama, and you're not aware of your cameras and your lenses and stuff, it's a lot harder to communicate with your crew, you know. You've got you to know about your lights. Even like, you know, even the f-stops and everything like that and what lenses you want on because they convey a totally different look. You know, I, I, is it a style of film that is going to play with um, a depth of field, you know? Um, is it, you know, people want to know what lenses, what kind of look, because that's actually what styles and gives the whole film the tone. Um, yeah, so you, you, you kind of do have to know a bit, especially in drama, just to be able to communicate and talk with all your HODs about what you want, yeah. Um, well, I usually shoot a lot of my stuff. Um, so I did shoot some of the documentary, the opening scene, wow, the closing that's scene, awesome. and a few other scenes in there. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. So, but in saying that, yeah. my, I mean, a lot of it's just point and shoot and just like, you know. I, I hope it comes out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not overly technical, but I know how to use the camera and, yeah, you know, yeah. I was, I was, um, second camera at Pacific Beach Street for a while. So mm. I did, I was doing all the digitizing yeah. and that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, and I have like the basics of editing, yeah. uh, but I, it's much better if someone else can edit for me. I'm very slow and I always have to do like YouTube, how do you do this? <laughs> yeah. um, Avid is um, the system that we use to edit on and, and that can be quite um, full on. But um, but so I kind of feel like I have like, like I'm a jack of all trades, but master of none, to be honest. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know? just because I know what I want doesn't mean I know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, so yes, yeah, so, you know, yeah, because, yeah, 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 so I don't, like, I don't edit. It's like rule number one in, in, in the drama edit suite. You know, you just don't touch the editors, you know. <laughs> you tell them what you want, but you don't touch their keyboard. So, you know, what, I'm clueless about editing. I just know. I don't like that frame. Cut out five frames there, there. You know, same with camera. I do not touch their camera, what? but I tell them if I don't like the shot. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you guys find that in the current climate now where the, everybody has access to gear now because of technology and kind of everyone's doing all multiple roles now? Well, that's and why I don't I've, know if we're I've losing the expertise to, in those different it, areas. And how do that's you why I've had to pick up how to edit, how, how to kind of do camera because, because being freelance, I haven't really had the luxury of being able to get a cameraman or mm. get an editor to do to do something which I would actually prefer <laughs> um, yeah so but that's kind of working kind of TV base level you could never edit your own commercials and that kind of stuff it just or depends films. on yeah. Yeah, yeah or films yeah. like I yeah. didn't we had a really good editor wow. for the documentary mm. Margot Margot Francis oh, she's so good <gasps> yeah so um, so yeah, it just depends on what project it is, yep. what you're doing, who you're doing it for, what the budget is. Yeah, it's it's come a long way. So I'm from the old school. Yeah, yeah. I learned, you know, how to cut a film film. <laughs> you know, like for on real. a Steenbeck for yeah. real, Steenbeck operator a films. Of, a lot of them listening now have no idea where. Oh yeah, from. okay. So that was when cameras was no such thing as digital cameras. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is now. Like, yeah, it was all film. Basically, it just runs like a sewing machine and film stock just goes through it. It's basically like a, yeah, and it takes photos, you know, uh, 25 frames, or uh, 24 frames a second. Uh, all changed now. So I came through that era, which is great. It was a great experience. Um, but it was so expensive that it was very elite. So, you know, it was so expensive. It was almost an elitist kind of, you know, core you know only like you could count the number of filmmakers on one hand and so it's it was even harder to break through because of that yeah. it was so expensive um you know uh but as the industry broke into um computerized and digitizing avid came out mm. oh my gosh and now all the software cameras have gotten cheaper more affordable the fact that they actually look as good as film, oh, there's only one camera I think that looks as good as film, and that's Ari Alexa, so that's about the only one. Uh, I think the others still got catching up to do, but um, 
the fact that it's actually good quality cameras are available, like broadcast quality, mm. and then the editing at home is just incredible. That means anyone can do it. And the classic example is films like Blair Witch, Blair Witch Project yeah, that came so out cool. just proved to everyone that you know you can do this at home, you can do it with your friends and then make a big hit out of it. And so films like that was like a milestone in terms of just, you know, the public going, oh shit, okay, oh, they can do that, we can do that. So now anyone can make a film. It's not elite anymore. It's not mm. a elite little club. I first learned how to edit at art school from one VCR through the TV oh. to another VCR. Can you just explain what VCR yeah. is? <laughs> just in case uh, those, people don't know. Those big tapes, yeah. I don't even know. The, yeah, yeah. yeah but. Weird, I... <laughs> VHS, I yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> yeah I, I reckon it's a good thing. It's a good change because then you are able to get stories that you would otherwise not get. Yeah. For example, um, I saw on Facebook once, there, um, a few days ago, there was a group of kids in Africa, I can't remember which country in Africa, where they all taught themselves how to edit special effects. So they were filming on a broken um, Samsung phone. They filmed their whole short film wow. using green screen <laughs> and editing on this one laptop that um, had hardly any bandwidth yeah. and they said it took them about a day and a half for their film to render. Yeah. <laughs> so they were all sitting there hoping that the power would stay on but also that the network connection would still be available for them and wow. they just did it. So you know you wouldn't otherwise get those kind of stories yeah. uh, coming through with the, if the technology wasn't easily yeah. available. We, if we didn't like we shot our the documentary on Canon 5D, yeah. and we so we wouldn't have been able to make the documentary if yeah. we had have waited for a better or bigger camera, yeah. you know. Um, now these cameras are good enough. So to, yeah. yeah, so we just yeah. went out and, and yes. started, yeah. you know. Mm. I mean, if you're a film wanker and you want, you know, the film look, yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> then you kind of just Serious. yeah. But yeah, but I mean, seriously, so many cameras are, are good enough to use for. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah, and that Tangerine film that came out a few years yeah. ago, all on, on an a iPhone. Phone. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. yeah. It's gonna have a good, good story. Thing. I think Anyone so. Can I think do it's it. a good story. There were there are certain. I think going back to Via's point about authenticity. If um, the story has comes from an authentic place, or is a story that is really authentic in its crafting, which is a really wanky way of saying it, but um, you know, it, people people can clock bullshit. Yeah. It's really easy to clock it, mm -hmm. and so as a storyteller, it's really about. Um, making sure that the story you're telling has an emotional truth that speaks to as many people as possible. So for example, like Vera's film, it's it's her family, it's literally, specifically her family, yeah, yeah. but the themes are so universal. Yeah. And I think that's what um, makes our story so special, especially Pacifica stories. I mean, if you look at some of the top grosses, Top grossing New Zealand films, mm. the top 10, majority of them are either Māori or Pacific. I think it's yeah. like the top uh, 7 out of 10. Yeah, 7 mm. out of 10 are. Uh, that's what Maori overseas Pacific. people yeah. want, but that's also what Kiwi locals want to go yeah. see, yeah. including Pakia. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're all, everyone here is prepared to pay, obviously, to go see. Uh, you know, Pacific Island films, uh, Māori films, they're actually prepared to fork out money. So and that's pretty like impressive. That, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But in overseas, it's, you know, that's generally what they want. It's that point of difference, eh? Yeah, yeah mm. but I think also too, just kind of at the end of the day, just the human conditions. Mm. We all want to yes. connect with human yeah. stories, you know what I mean? So... Um, like Moonlight and, the, and all those kind of stories, they can be yeah. whatever, yes. but the issues in it are just that general, that anyone can, yeah, yeah connect yeah. with. 
I feel like that's really an, an important part of exactly what you were saying, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and making good work is that it can really connect yep. with the viewer. Yes. I think in regards to people that want to tell drama, uh, probably, I think the hardest of the, all the crafts in the film industry, I think, is probably script writing. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's because, it, you know, the storytelling, it, it does, it, you know, it is a craft. Mm. I find that the hardest, not directing, you know, and, you know, running a set. I find that really easy. I mean, yeah, but writing for me is really hard. And, um, and I think when you read so many scripts, you, you start to realise, God, great stories are really hard to come by. It's not necessarily the story, it's just the craft. It's like it takes years of commitment. Um, I'm really happy to say that there's so many Pacific Island, you know, people that are willing to learn to write. I've seen them at workshops. It's been incredible. Uh, what is that, South Shorts? South, um, yeah. South Shorts, um, different workshops yeah. that Film Commission put on, yeah. you know, just been drawing out more and more people keen to write or give it a go yeah. and uh, tell their stories. Because actually there's no, there's no films without the script. So yeah. basically if you don't have uh, the scripts, it's just nothing, nothing can be made in terms of drama. Yeah, mm. so that's actually the starting place, so. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's why I do documentary, because scripts are so hard. Yeah. They're scary. Yeah. 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 I can't write. I can't spell. <laughs> That's really interesting with the whole thing, film, documentary. And like you used to do like all the, those amazing intros for the Pacific Music Awards, like those kind of segments. You did Caps as videos. Yeah. And how, how do you guys, um, I mean, is, is that something that you guys still do, is hop outside of your main kind of film lens to actively seek out those other I just do lenses. what I love doing. If something comes along and then or if someone asks it and I'm like, got no time, not into it, I say no. Cool. I actually say no a lot. That's mm. such an important thing I've, <laughs> I've realised. No eh? how, how important is it to say no? Because that's something I've definitely found we struggle with in this yeah. industry is the ability to say no. Because our default setting is to try yeah. to please everybody and say I, yes to everything. Well, because we know it's a huge commitment. Like, you can't, you know, you kind of like, fuck, you know, feature film, it's like two years commitment, you know, minimum. 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 You minimum, yeah. so you can't. They say seven yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. Seven For a years full, just to make it, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, yeah. start to end on, yeah. on a feature. Yeah. The yes. very starting to the very yeah. ending. So two wow. weeks ago, I have a produ I had a producer ring up, and, and she's <laughs> like, Sima, would you like to direct this TV movie coming up? And I, I straight away I said, look, <laughs> um, I have a habit of saying no, just a warning, because, you know, just to be polite so they know I haven't judged their script. Mm. Um, so straight up, it's like straight up, I have a habit of saying no, um, but, you know, I, I look into it, you know, and so they were a bit taken aback, you know, because they're not used to people saying no. Mm. Uh, but they said, OK, well, I will send you the script. It's ready to shoot in November, October, you know, we'll be yeah. filming some, yep, yeah, wow. and filming some of it in Argentina. And I'm like, OK, well, I might still say no, <laughs> just be prepared. Um, because, you know, I just think some stories are more suited for other filmmakers. Some stories just aren't me. I'm just like, you know. And it, it is a big commitment because then, you know, you know you're going to stress out for how long or whatever. So uh, fortunately, I really like the story, yeah. you know, um, and I said yes to it. But it, it, that is like one of the few. But there's so many others that you say no because you've got to look after yourself too to make sure you're protected because it's um, emotionally grueling. It's also physically, for me anyway, directing is actually quite a physical load. Because I go a bit, um, you know, the creative space and you go a bit nutty, mm. you know, a lot of sleepless nights, uh, it's a lot of pressure, you know, I'm really good at hiding the pressure, so I look like, oh, the most relaxed director in the world, but I'm actually shitting myself, because, mm. you know, you, you've got to pull it off. Yeah, and mm. kind of riffing off that, like, how important is mental health? for creatives because you know oh, there's the, a lot of yeah. the creatives that we know um you know burn out or um or just work themselves that's what happened to, to me the bone. Yeah, yeah four years ago i burnt like, out 
Yeah, burnt and how out. Did you, how did I've you, never how, experienced did you find, that in my life. Yeah, going through that. Yeah, and that's because, silly me, because um, I'm so used to going, uh, you know, like you go, uh, you, a project comes along, you just go, you go full on, like no sleep, eh? you know, you can go on for months doing mm. a project. And then when it's finished, it's you always have time to come down mm. like that. But I did a job that went on for a long time and didn't have the downtime to relax. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, when you can uh, burn out. Mm. It's something we have to look after each other on, eh? I think um, I've had a lot of friends go that way too. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because it's so, it's not like a nine to five. Mm. You can't just put it down. You know, you're like thinking True. about it. And even when you're sleeping, you're freaking dreaming about it yeah. <laughs> you know and so yeah it's but it's really hard to actually be like no let's just chill out and just not work today because yeah. there's always a list of stuff to to get done and be doing that you should have done like two weeks ago yeah. three weeks ago a month ago you yeah. know so um yeah, I mean, I'm really lucky at the moment because I'm on a bit of a festival run. So I have been able to like go to festivals and lie on the beach. Can you name <laughs> you know? <them? laughs> no, no, just get a massage, you know, yeah. but, but, you know, just take some time out time yeah. because even though I still have a list of stuff to do, but it's just I know that I just like trashed myself getting it to, you know, this point. So it's like. So that's the only, what is it, um, you know, like after you work your butt off on your films, this is what happens. Yeah. You then get flown around the world. You're broke. Yes. <laughs> this yeah, is the thing, yeah. thing with filmmakers. When you make a feature film, this is what happens. You're broke. You know, the family's broke because you borrowed from them and stuff like that to get by. You're broke. But the film, once it enters into the festival circuit, yeah. They fly you around, so you kind of get so it's a, it's a very odd thing because yeah. you're like you know <laughs> all the filmmakers there are poor, but everyone's lavishing you with you know beautiful things and hotels and food. So I guess yeah. that's the way you know um, you know th yeah. that's some what is it? It's a nice silver lining. Yeah. it's a nice thing that happens once it's done. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you just kind of want to. You go crazy in the lead up to yeah, and you don't even it. want to see your film again because you've no. seen it hundreds no, of times on the No, but then they stick you right up the front <laughs> yeah. in the middle, and you can't even escape. Yes, oh, man. Oh, that's it's torture. Annoying. How many times have you seen your film now? Oh, during the, this festival run, maybe maybe like um, I'd say like nine times or something, yeah. which is like. Eight times too many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then it's on top of. Oh, the yeah, in the edit. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, heaps, heaps. But in saying that, I can watch it through and be like, there's not one frame that I'm not happy with. <gasps> That's wow. good because I hate watching my no, films. So that, I'm that, always going, oh. Because no, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, there's, okay, there's one, one tiny point. But, but I took so long to pitch a lock yeah. because I just wanted to. And, and I just stressed everyone out and yeah. overspent the budget because I was like, no, like, Good I just need to redo this, redo this. Because this is this, it hangs with you for life, yeah. these yeah. things, you know, and they go round and yeah. round and yeah. like, you know, Automighty. The... I hate watching that because yeah. I'm always like, ah, but, but look at, like, it's many. still, it's still <laughs> fresh today. It's still played <laughs> out in whatever, yeah. you know, <laughs> so you've got to, you, you put work out there, you put your best work out there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What's next for you guys? What's the next episode? What's the next chapter in terms of, I mean, you guys are already masters of your craft, but. That in a crazy way you... film I said yes to. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Straight wow. in, I'm going, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> but that's great. Big project. Yeah, so it's a big one. So, yeah, a crew are quite hard to find because there's so many films being shot. Yeah. Wow. All around the same time. Weirdly yeah. enough, a lot of Kiwi films, but also a lot of overseas films. So it's like, well, it's a bit of a battle at the moment. I mean, at least we've got like Elbow, our cinematographer, oh, which is nice. awesome, I know. What a score. So, um, yeah, which is really nice. And then um, a horror film maybe with, um, yeah, which is really cool with a bunch of other Pacific Island uh, writers. 
so you know well, it's really awesome and a wonderful company and um, and then another project which is uh, my own film that I wrote last year and got Ooh. funded for and that's a feature film um, with a wonderful producer like she's one of the top-notch producers of New Zealand she's really amazing and she goes back to, to theatre days with me as well so Who's that? Um, Philippa Campbell oh. yeah she's awesome and so yeah, we're looking to, you know, hopefully get that off the ground sometime and film next year. Wow. Yeah. It really is seven years, huh? Yeah, yeah. it really mm. is seven years. It's a, it's a long <laughs> period I reckon. Of film. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've got uh, development funding for um, Tor. You know the Samoan story about the girl who experiences stigmata? Oh, yeah, no. and I've kind of had a relationship with her I did a short film with her and um which showed with the feature film yes in Berlin yes well, yeah was. so um so I'm really excited about um getting stuck into that but after this whole other film has left yeah so um and there's just a couple of other little tiny things but yeah, I really just can't wait to get on with this next film because this family one is <laughs> pretty <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and where's the um, where's the film going to next? What are there any other festivals coming up? Um, yes, there is. When does this come out? Soon. Uh, September. A few uh, weeks. Okay. Oh, I'm not sure if I can say though. But a really good indigenous pe festival um, sure. in the world. Yay. Um, yeah. Yay. Yeah, 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 which is cool. And I'm trying to get over there too because I know that it's a different kind of the indigenous scene is completely different. So I just want to check that out. And um, yeah, there's a couple of other ones in there. But you can't say it's so weird this whole secrecy around film festivals. But anyway, mm. it's a good ride. For those who are just starting, what would be some summary points and advice, practical? advice in terms of how they you know oh i would say i'm still a student i'm still learning <laughs> like you never stop growing and learning mm. i think that's the thing and i think maybe that's why um yeah that's what keeps the passion going because you know everything is different every project's unique mm. um if i if you knew anything you know like why bother doing it so and I think that's that's about being a creative I think it's always growing and learning uh, with new people new projects new ideas so I think keeping an open mind and that um, you know even at my age uh, I'm still learning so much to do it's wonderful <laughs> mm. yeah yeah I mean I guess um don't give up because you can scrape the bottom of the barrel and keep scraping and scraping and scraping. Your bottom of your barrel is actually never ending, you know. So that's one of my things is like don't stop until you finish because it's so easy to just chuck the towel in. But, you know, you, you have to keep working and you made this journey, you started this journey for a reason. So you just got to keep going even though it's really hard. Take some time out if you're getting stressed out about stuff. Reassess and then problem solve. It's all about filmmaking is problem solving. It is troubleshooting, eh? Troubleshooting, mm. troubleshooting Something continuously. Comes out, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite amazing. Yeah, so. yeah. A really good skill to, mm. to have. Mm. Yep. Mm. Um, I think surrounding yourself with like-minded people is really handy um, because there'll be moments where you feel like like just how you said throwing in the towel um, having that support network around you that'll help fold your laundry you know cook some food for you pick your kids up from work or from school and you know drive you all these places um, and having that support network, having really good people around you, I think is is a really important thing to have. And knowing who those people are, um, you know, because you quite often you can't take everyone. 
And so it's about, um, yeah, really, really um, putting in mind what that goal is that you want to do, understanding that you're going to be scraping the bottle, the bottom of your barrel for quite some time, but knowing that there are other people there scraping it with you or holding your hair up or, you know, feeding you while you're still scraping, that's, that's really important. And that's right. We all have turned scraping. Like yeah. everyone's, yeah. it's like just that. Everyone, it's hey, that, everyone has their time, sit down, and you help each other. Like yeah. that's the thing. You go eat at your mates that's just scored a job. Mm. <laughs> it's so funny that you're saying that though, because that's exactly what my family, like my little yeah. sister who's sitting yeah. over there, but <laughs> they've been the ones like yeah. helping me scrape. <laughs> yeah. clean, pick up my kids, look out for my kids. So, yeah, family is key. Eh? Yes. Your support people, yes. mm. you need your support people. Yeah. yeah. Good one. Yeah. And it helps if they have money. <laughs> yeah. Or a car. Yeah. Or a car. Yeah. Or alcohol. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. But, yeah, just... And I think we're... Um, the Pacific culture is, is quite um, unique because we're brought up that way, where everyone mucks in, everyone helps out. If you need help, you just have to turn around and ask your sibling or your cousin or your cousin's brother's uncle's sister who just happens to know how to hold a mic, you know, all that kind of stuff. They're um, utilising those networks that you already have and the people that you grow up. It's, it's amazing looking around within your own circle how many people can help you or are willing to help. All you have to do is ask. Because the worst that people can say is no. Mm. Yeah. So just ask anyway. And just before we wrap up, because we're going to head upstairs, and we're going to have uh, some great feed. This week our food sponsor is Yummy King, who have the best pork and rice. They are the new pork and rice champions oh, from Rewa. Yeah, and if anybody yeah. else out there wants to sponsor some food, like send it in. Okay. But, I mean, for you guys, in this, like, do you guys have any favourite food spots, like at the end of a... Industry night, whether you drink or not, do you guys have any? What's, what's your guys' favourite go-to recommendations at the end of a good we have night? A, we have, I'm sorry, but we have one of the best Samoa shops in Avondale on the main shop area. Yeah, okay. Have you been there? Come on. Yeah. They sell luau, galo, oh my gosh, yeah. fa'osi. It's like, man, Yo. the works. I mean, it's like being back, it's being transported back in Samoa when you walk in there. It's like galo, everything's yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, we're spoiled. We have to be careful just not to overeat yeah. Yeah. because it's like so handy. What's it called again? I don't know. <laughs> it's also seen in main <laughs> spots where um, you who? Yo. I don't know. We just call it Odahu, but it's that little. Um, they got it's got ducks in the window. On the corner, yeah, yeah. No, no, no not in the corner. Double, oh, double happy. Yeah, double, double happy. happy. Oh, oh my gosh, yo. so good. Yo. Yeah, and and my kids like love the barbecue pork, Ooh, and so yummy. that's our like. Yeah. If we've had like a, you know, if we're celebrating, <laughs> we go and get, I don't know, <laughs> or get Bubsy to bring it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Where's your spot? Uh, um, I really love ribs. So there's a really good ribs place up on the North Shore um, called Rack and Roll Ribs. Oh. The best oh, ribs. Yeah. <laughs> Rack and Roll Ribs. You must ribs. love your ribs. It is. <laughs> The best, yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, cheers, guys, and oh, thank you cheers, so much. Um, I don't drink. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you thank so much. If you want to be notified every time we drop a new video, hit subscribe and ring the bell. Cheers. <laughs>